Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me for another presentation. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about acute injury management. So when you get an injury on the ice or in training, you know, what, what do you do about it? And how do we approach that? And how do we go from that point of injury back to return to play? So we're going to try to give you some insight into what we look for as physiotherapists and how you can manage it yourselves as athletes. So we're looking at that management of sprains and strains. Quick bio of Sasha, as well as a quick bio of myself. We've gone over uh, these before, but you guys are welcome to take a, take a look on the website if you want to learn more. So our agenda today, we're going to go over what is a sprain and what is a strain and the difference between the two. We're going to spend a lot of time on the stages of healing. So when we get injured, you know, what stages do we go through from uh, that initial inflammatory stage all the way to a remodeling stage and finally when we're fully healed. Uh, we're going to talk about the rehab during each stage and how that differs and how we can, you know, tailor that rehab specifically to the stage that we're in. We're going to talk about how we as physios and how you as athletes can determine the prognosis. So how long will your rehab take? Uh, the benefits of an early assessment after injury, as well as discussing you, the athlete, as an active partner in your rehab. So this is a diagram that's going to come up again later on in the presentation, but if we take a quick look, so we've just sustained an injury, let's say we've got a sprain to our AC joint, you know, that AC joint is going to go through multiple stages of healing until it's, you know, completely repaired or as close to completely repaired as we can get. So the first stage is the inflammatory stage, and these are rough timelines that apply to most injuries. So that's going to be roughly four to six days post-injury. You'll notice there's overlap between stages as well. We get into a proliferation stage that's four to 24 days post-injury, and then we get into a remodeling stage that's 21 days to two years post-injury. <clears throat> the two-year time frame will surprise a lot of people. Um, based on what you've heard before, we'll say, yeah, you know, you should be fully healed after six months or so, but remodeling takes a long time. And that's really where physio comes in and helps influence uh, the, the tissue stress that you're getting there. So we're going to spend a lot of time on, on those different phases. But first, we're going to talk about sprains and strains. So this is a cheesy reference to an old movie that maybe some of the coaches and parents will understand, but I'm sure it's going to be over a lot of the heads of the athletes there. Um, so sprains and strains are injuries to ligaments or muscles. You'll notice I've underlined the P and the T there, very similar words, but a sprain is an injury to a ligament and a strain is an injury to a muscle. You'll hear us at the clinic and other medical practitioners talking about the grade of injury from mild to severe or grade one to three. And this is a language we use for uh, simplicity of communication. But the reality is these injuries exist on a spectrum of, you know, microscopic damage or no damage at all to a complete rupture or tear of that tissue. So we're going to talk. About so first we're going to talk about ligament sprains, so injuries to ligaments. Again, ligaments are tissues that attach bone to bone, okay? And they always cross a joint. So typically ligaments are there to stabilize two bones moving in relation to one another. So for example, if we picture the knee, we have ligaments around our knee that prevent our knee from hyperextending or bending too far into a straightening position. Um, some common examples that you'll hear, the MCL or the ACL in the knee, the ATFL in the ankle or the anterior talofibular ligament, as well as the ulnar collateral ligament in the elbow. Um, these are all Latin derived names. They sound complex, but basically they just name the attachment points where the ligaments attach. So the ulna collateral ligament, for example, uh, attaches on the ulna uh, bone. And uh, collateral just means it's on the outside of the joint. And it's a ligament. So the, the names can be fairly simple. Um, the UCL, the ulnar, ulnar collateral ligament, is what you commonly hear about in baseball players when they get Tommy John surgery. That's the ligament that's repaired there. <clears throat> Ligaments are compo composed uh, of connective tissue, so collagen, elastin, and reticulin. And these fibers are generally passive tissues, meaning they don't have muscles that are causing them to move, but they simply stop the joint from moving too far. 
Uh, again, think about that example of the knee hyperextending too much. And similar to muscle injuries, sprains exist on a spectrum of zero to 100% damage. When you come into the clinic and we're looking at the physical assessment of ligament injuries, there are a few things that we're trying to do. Our overall goals, we wanna help determine the severity or grade of the injury that you've had to your ligament, the stage of healing that you're currently in, depending on what time frame post-injury you've come into the clinic, and your general prognosis for recovery. So how long it's gonna take you to get better. So we're gonna take a thorough subjective history, ask about how you injured yourself, probably ask in gross detail, uh, we want to put our detective hat on and try to piece all those uh, you know, pieces together about what happened, what you felt at the time, did you know the swelling, lots of questions that will seem a little bit annoying, but they really help us diagnose you accurately. Uh, we'll be observing for swelling, bruising, potential deformity in the ankle or wherever you had the injury. Uh, and you know, if you're walking with a limp, for example, those things can give us clues as well. <clears throat> we'll be checking out your joint range of motion. And a key thing with, with ligament injuries is we'll always be doing joint stability or laxity tests. Laxity is just a funny word that pertains to uh, how tight the ligament is. So this lets us know how stretched out or loose the ligament has become after an injury that's, that's stretched it out. Um, and we compare this to typically an uninjured side. So you'll often feel us grabbing on two bones, wiggling the joint in relation to another uh, bone there. Um, and it might have a funny feeling, might induce pain, but we'll uh, explain everything that's going on there. But the findings from those and how loose that ligament is, is a key finding for us to know what sort of damage we've done on the ligament and help us determine how long it's gonna take to get better what that end point is, you know, how much better are we going to get? <clears throat> so we're ultimately trying to determine that approximate grade of injury that we'll discuss in a minute. Uh, you'll feel us poking around through there as well. And we also want to assess any additional tissue injury. So maybe you injured a ligament, maybe we also, you know, strain a muscle in the process. Um, and we want to make sure we do as thorough of an assessment as possible so we can help with those contributing factors. So this is a rough summary of how we grade those ligamentous injuries. Again, you'll see grade one, two, and three. You might hear people use the terms mild, moderate, and severe. We don't like to use that language too much, again, because those injuries exist on a spectrum. So, you know, if we look under grade one, kind of a textbook grade one injury is, you know, uh, structural damage only on a microscopic level. And then grade two, we have a partial tear or rupture of the ligament. Sometimes you might hear about 50% of the fibers of the ligament have been damaged. But, you know, we've got a spectrum. So maybe you're 10% of those fibers have been damaged or 25%. So you're kind of right between grade one and grade two. Um, we really rely on those stability tests, how loose that ligament feels to, to see what category that we fall into. And again, the grading is for ease of communication and determining that prognosis. But again, those injuries exist on the spectrum. So the grade one injury, typically a very small percentage of fibers are torn. We're going to have slight local tenderness around the ligament that's been damaged, and we may or may not have swelling. And there's going to be no looseness of that ligament, so no joint instability or laxity. Grade two, so again, roughly about 50% of the fibers have been damaged from that ligament. We start getting some stretch in that ligament, uh, so it's stretched out and our joint moves more than it used to. We still have a solid endpoint. That ligament's still hanging on. We're going to have lots of swelling with these, uh, and we're going to have you know mild joint instability. When I talked about that, that ligament loosening out. Uh, grade three is a complete rupture, a complete tear of that ligament. Again, we'll be doing the joint stability test to see how loose that ligament is, and here we're going to find that there's no solid endpoint. So we start getting into some other ligaments or the joint capsule or other tissues that prevent us from moving there. The ligament we're testing is not stopping us because it's complete torn or ruptured. Um, and again, significant swelling. We may or may not have pain with this. Obviously, there's pain at the time of the injury. We may not have pain with the joint stability testing because you know we're not actually pulling on any injured tissue when we when we move that. So uh, that's something to take into consideration. 
So now we'll move on to talking about muscular injuries or strains. So ST reins, we've got that T underlined uh, in comparison to sprains. I know it's a small difference, but it's a, just talks about the tissue that we've injured there. So strains are injuries to the muscle and the muscle tendon unit. Uh, the tendon being that connective tissue that connects our muscle to our bone. Um, and it also is comprised of contractile tissue. So what's actually in the muscle, those red fibers, you know, picture uh, a steak that's uncooked. We've got those red contractile muscle fibers and those help us move uh, our bones across joints there. The injury can occur at the muscle, at the tendon attachment to the bone, at the musculotendinous junction or where the muscle and the tendon meet up. And we'll help determine that with your assessment. Uh, muscles cross one or multiple joints, and I mentioned that again, similar to the ligaments, because muscles that typically cross multiple joints, for example, one of our quadriceps muscles, the erectus femoris, they're typically more susceptible to injury, uh, and we see more strains in those muscles. So that can help us with our assessment and our rehab as well. And again, just a reminder, strains exist on a spectrum from 0 to 100% even though we grade them one to three, similar to ligaments. So when you come into the clinic, your physical assessment of muscular strains is gonna look somewhat similar to the, your assessment of ligament sprains. Uh, again, our goals are the same. We wanna help determine the severity or the grade of injury, the stage of healing that you're currently in, depending on how long it took you to come into the clinic and your prognosis for recovery or how long it's gonna take you to recovery what that end point is going to be, how recovered will we get compared to before the injury. We're going to take that thorough subjective history, do our detective work, we're going to do our observation again, uh, and key things with muscles are that we're going to do flexibility tests compared to the opposite side or compared to normative data that we have from working with lots and lots of patients over the years, and also muscle strength tests. So you may see us, you know, having a little bit of a tug of war with you in the clinic where we try to get you to hold your joint in one position and try not to let us move it. And that's to stress out that injured tissue and see, you know, if you're painful and how much weakness we have to the, uh, compared to the opposite side. Or again, compared to that normative data, what's normal for somebody your age and activity level. <clears throat> we try to measure these as objectively as possible. So sometimes we'll hook up a little scale uh, when we're doing those tests, and it'll say, how many pounds of force can you produce within that muscle? And again, we'll compare it to the other side to see what percentage of strength that you're at. And we can track that over time as you improve. So we have as objective as possible of a marker for your improvement and your readiness to return to play. We'll be using the results from those flexibility and strength tests primarily to determine the grade of injury that you've suffered and uh, help determine your prognosis as well. Again, we will palpate, so we're gonna feel around for tenderness or deformity. Sometimes we can feel little gaps in those muscles if there's been some significant tearing, um, or we're just looking for tenderness and pain there too. And of course, we're gonna assess additional tissue injury. <clears throat> we're gonna have a summary here. Again, strains for simplicity graded on scale of uh, one to three. So grade one, Less than 10% of the fibers approximately have been torn, grade two approximately 50%, and grade three being a full rupture. And you can look through the uh, findings there. We don't have to spend too much time on that. Uh, just a summary of how those are gonna present in clinic and information that we use to help determine that grade for you. So when we're determining prognosis, you're asking your physio, you know, how long is this gonna take to, to get better? That depends on a couple things, um, and you know that's what we're trying to figure out in that initial physical assessment, which is why it's so thorough. So we're going to look at the grade of injury. So obviously, the higher the grade of injury, the longer it's going to take to get better. The demand of your desired sport and activity. So getting back to hockey, obviously a very strenuous sport. Um, you know, does have contact, and even for females, has incidental contact. Um, so, you know, we're, we're putting a lot of stress on our body and depending on the area of the body that's injured, you know, we have a higher demand than somebody that's going back to an office job, for example. Uh, we take into account the anticipated healing environment. So things like the quality of your sleep, quality of our nutrition to support that healing tissue, 
your age, typically the younger the age, the faster our healing capacity is going to be. What sort of baseline physical strength that we have? You know, if our strength is higher, typically that's going to be a, you know, a better healing capacity for us, depending on that uh, tissue that's injured. General stressors within our lives. So if we have things that are, you know, increasing the stress hormone circulating within our body, that can be a catabolic source, uh, meaning it's going to take away from our healing capacity as well. Uh, and we've changed the color on the next one. Proper rehab is a big key there. And we'll go over what exactly that looks like and how that influences your, your time to recovery. We're also going to take into account potential aggravating factors. So if we have a re-injury from returning to play too early or returning to too aggressive training too early, along the same vein, overuse. So maybe we're doing too much and not allowing ourselves to recover adequately or just an overall improper healing environment. We're getting low quality of those things that we uh, mentioned above. <clears throat> so we'll go back to these stages of healing here. Again, we have the inflammation stage, the proliferation stage, and the remodeling stage. Let's go over those together. So first is the inflammation stage that generally occurs from four to six days post-injury. So from the time of injury uh, until that four to six day mark. So inflammation is completely necessary to healing and should not be overly disrupted. So often we see people applying lots of ice, taking anti-inflammatories, trying to get that inflammation down at all costs. But this is a necessary process that our body needs to go through uh, in order to clean up the injured tissue, uh, form a blood clot to uh, help with that scar tissue bridging later on, um, as well as bring some nice healing factors to those areas. So we've got some tissue death, we've got that blood clot forming. We get some different materials coming down to the injury site that's gonna remove that injured tissue or remove that debris. And again, we're gonna get stimulation of muscle or connective tissue growth from those inflammatory factors that come into the area as well. So again, we don't wanna overly disrupt that process. You may hear us advising to apply ice or compression things that are going to control the inflammation a little bit, but not completely limit it. Um, and you can use the advice from your physio on what exactly to do in that initial stage, depending on you know, your individual injury. <clears throat> uh, within the inflammation stage, we also quickly move into an anti-inflammatory stage where that inflammation slowly comes down. And that's typically around two to four days post-injury. Uh, so again, there's some overlap there as we see that inflammation come up and then come down. Our rehab goals within this phase, uh, we really want to protect that injured tissue from getting injured even further, okay? So let's say we've got a grade two injury to a ligament. We've got 50% of those fibers torn approximately. We don't want to tear the remaining 50%. So you may see us within physiotherapy use things like bracing, taping, tensor bandaging, uh, the use of crutches to protect some lower body injuries, and we're going to talk about restricted activity. So what you can and can't do um, that's going to be safe for your joints and things that we want to, you know, minimize in that initial phase. Overall, we want to promote that healing environment. We want to promote fresh blood flow to that injured tissue uh, so we can get all those nice growth factors that we need for muscle or ligament repair. And we're going to educate you again on that proper load uh, and activities that you can sustain and activities that might not be uh, safe quite yet for you. This is a good summary of what we're trying to focus on within the inflammatory stage. So this is from uh, a clinician named Blaise Dubois, and he came up with this new acronym. acronym. Uh, you may have heard the old acronym RICE, which would be rest, ice, compression, and elevation that we advised in the future. He made it a little bit more complex, but a little bit more comprehensive, peace and love. So that's protection. So avoiding activities and movement that increase pain during the first few days after injury. Elevation, so to try to control too much swelling. Avoid anti-inflammatories. Again, we can discuss this in detail in the clinic and with your doctor as well, but generally we don't want anti-inflammatories in the mix here for, um, for injuries unless that inflammation gets too out of control. Compression also, also helps manage excessive swelling. And big education piece, which we've talked about already, we'll continue to talk about for the remainder of the presentation. 
Uh, LOVE, the L-O-V-E acronym, stands for load. So progressive loading of the tissue, using pain as your guide. Optimism, so thinking about that mental state and you know, keeping engaged with your team and uh, trying to do as best as we can to create that healing environment and acknowledge the situation and you know do the best we can to promote that healing. Vascularization, basically a fancy word for promoting that solid blood flow to get those nice growth factors going. And exercise therapy, which of course is a big thing that we do. And uh, that's gonna come in in the next couple stages uh, being very important as well. So when we move to the next stage, we're talking about our proliferation phase where we get a proliferation of scar tissue and also called our fibroblastic repair phase or our myoblastic repair phase, where we're really trying to repair that injured tissue. This happens from about four to 24 days post-injury. <clears throat> proliferation, as per the Oxford Dictionary, means a rapid reproduction of a cell, part, or organism. So basically we're getting a rapid reproduction of cell growth. So picture we've got two ends of an injured muscle, we want to try to bridge that gap between those two ends, create a nice scar tissue bridge um, in order to you know, heal that, that tissue. We've got a piece of chewing gum down there, and I always use the analogy of, you know, in this fibroblastic repair phase, our body's in a hurry to bridge that gap as fast as possible. So we're not totally worried about tissue quality yet. So it's essentially like our body is tossing down a piece of chewing gum to bridge that gap, Chewing gum is not strong in any particular direction. It's very dissimilar from the original ligament or muscle. It doesn't have the same qualities in it. It's highly susceptible to injury. So we still wanna protect things within this phase because again, that chewing gum or that uh, scar tissue bridge that we're forming is very weak. Once we get into the remodeling phase, we can start to apply a little bit more stress to it. Um, our rehab goals in this phase we want to continue to protect that healing tissue again. We do initiate controlled loading in strong positions, and we'll, you know, you follow the advice of your physiotherapist to, to see what's safe for you in that position. Um, and we want to maintain and improve your general physical fitness and the health of your supportive tissues as well. So we want to make sure the health of all your other tissues is kept up to snuff or potentially improving so that, you know, when that scar tissue bridge is ready to load, we can kind of hit the ground running and we haven't lost too much hockey specific fitness. Big caution in this phase, again, that chewing gum, that scar tissue bridge is weak. We really want to avoid overstretching. So sometimes when we've had an injury to a muscle, it could feel good in the moment to, to stretch it out excessively. We would rather have that muscle be tight for a long period of time and be strong. So we'd rather have strong and tight than lengthened and weak. Okay, and that's something that you'll hear your, your physio talk about lots, and that's the reasoning behind it. Generally, we're gonna use pain as our guide um, to know that if there's too much stress going on within a tissue. The remodeling phase is our exciting phase of rehab, and this is when we get into more uh, you know, strenuous exercise therapy and exercises that look a little bit more similar to hockey-specific steels. So we're trying to get that tissue ready for performance and we're progressively increasing the load throughout it. <clears throat> so what happens in this phase? We have various sources of mechanical stimulation that help to signal remodeling. So again, we've got that piece of chewing gum that's, that's uh, stuck down there. We want to continue to remodel that tissue to make that chewing gum really strong, make that like the original muscle that was damaged or the original ligament that was damaged and add lines of stress in the direction that we need them. Uh, so how does this occur? So there's a fancy word that we call mechanotransduction. It's any mechanism that our cells in our body convert a mechanical stimulus into electrochemical activity. So we can take a, a stimulus like a stretch or a contraction across that scar tissue bridge and we can turn that into remodeling. So that's a stimulus for our body to lay down more connective tissue fibers, lay down more muscle fibers to make us strong in the directions that we need to. Again, that initial piece of chewing gum bridge, weak in all directions, we want strength in specific directions for those the ligament and muscle injuries. Uh, our goals, we wanna provide the appropriate mechanical stimulus. 
So we do this primarily through exercise, but also through massage, through joint mobilization, getting that joint moving properly, and other things like electrical stimulation. There's a few more things that we use in the clinic that you may have seen before too, um, but we're going to be heavy on the exercise therapy. Again, this is the fun phase of rehab where we start doing more hockey specific exercises and you start feeling like you're getting more of a workout and doing more stuff that you're used to with traditional strength conditioning programs um, you know, when you're not injured. Big caution in this phase, we want to avoid stopping rehab too early. That's not because we want to keep you in the clinic as long as possible. We're here to facilitate your independence and educate you guys, but we want to make sure that you're safe when you go back to returning to play. Very often people get to a point where they're pain free with their daily activities. They're like, okay, I'm ready to return to play, but haven't necessarily gone uh, and undergone objective strengthening testing, you know, ligamentous stability testing compared to your uninjured side and getting back to 100% of your full strength to the point where, you know, re-injury is very, very low likelihood. Um, so again, we try to use those objective markers of improvement like strength test, sport specific performance test to signal that readiness to return to play. <clears throat> this is a slide I borrowed from my previous presentation, but it's worth a review here. So when we have an acute injury, when do we seek treatment? Generally, if your injury is affecting your ability to play hockey or complete athletic activities at your highest desired ability, seek treatment as soon as possible. We are here to educate you on your injury and empower you to manage it independently as best as you can. The more information you get up front, the better your recovery is going to be long term. If we wait and we delay the assessment for that injury, things aren't getting better after a week or so, you know, you're just going to delay your overall recovery. Um, and you can review the remaining notes on that slide. We don't have to spend too much time on them. Being an active rehab partner, this is a very important part of your rehab. Uh, we want to seek understanding by asking questions and voicing your concerns with your therapist. So again, we are here as an educator for you. We're trying to get you to understand everything as best as possible, because ultimately you're spending lots of time with yourself and a small amount of time in the clinic. So you're a much more important part of your, your rehab than we are as physios. <clears throat> your physio should be able to explain uh, their reasoning in simple terms for the rehab decisions. You know, for example, why is this activity safe and why is this other activity not safe? And if they can't explain it in simple terms, you should continue to press them until you understand it. Again, we're here to support you. Try to rely on your physio as an educator and look at the silver lining with an injury. It's an opportunity to gain lots of information that can potentially help you or your friends in the future. Again, thinking about participating in your rehab in and out of the clinic, you're gonna spend lots more time out of the clinic than you are in. And try to maintain your general physical and mental health. So things like joining team functions, practices and games, and you wanna stay engaged as, as much as possible. As a summary, things that I want you guys to remember from this presentation, try to know your phases of recovery and act accordingly. We're not going to do lots of sport specific movements in that inflammatory phase. And if we try to rush things too much and we don't let that inflammation occur, we're going to pay for it long term. And conversely, when we're in that remodeling phase, we're not going to be resting and elevating and using compression. That'll be wasting our time. We want to do lots of strenuous exercise in that phase. In that inflammatory stage, we're thinking about peace and love. We want to avoid overstretching in the proliferation phase. We've got that weak chewing gum scar tissue bridge. In both the proliferation and remodeling phase, we're going to get progressive loading on the tissue, and that's very important, and it'll get more complex, more strenuous as you go. We want to think about avoid quitting rehab too early. So avoid quitting that strength training, mobility training, balance training, all that fun stuff too early and using those objective markers to signal your readiness to return to play. We're gonna seek early assessment to help understand the grade of our injury, determine your prognosis, and form a game plan for healing, and be an active rehab partner, very important. Couple of quick reference slides here for you guys. Some picture references. Thank you very much for paying attention to the presentation again. We hope you guys are finding it very beneficial. 
again, if you have any questions, you can email us at kmha at grsm.ca. We also have a website set up with all the previous videos. And again, you'll see the password there to uh, that website. Thanks again for joining and uh, we'll see you at our next presentation. Uh, soon we're gonna be going over some case studies and reviewing these stages of rehab and how they pertain to specific injuries like shoulder injuries or knee injuries. See you guys soon.